Good morning and welcome to Fifth Street Baptist Church where Reverend Dr. Joshua Dreyer is our pastor and this is our Sunday School Hour with the Senior Adult Class. The title of our session today is Honoring Life. This will be session number four. Uh, my name is Vaughn Summers and I'll be your facilitator for this session. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to serve you. We thank you, Lord, for uh, the lessons that you have taught us, O oh God. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who, who guides us and convicts us and shows us, teaches us how to be obedient as we study your word. We pray, O oh God, that, this, that we would continue to submit and uh, uh, surrender our lives to you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our personal study guides always starts our sessions with a picture and a question. Well, session four's picture is an adult hand holding a child's hand. And the question is, what are some ways you show others that they are valued. Well, I choose to answer it this way. Well, I'll listen to them. I'll listen intently to them. I'll focus on what they have to say. I'll analyze it and I'll digest it. And I'll be empathetic toward them after listening. You know, Pastor Tony Evans is the author of this these series lessons and he writes uh, he said this and I'm, and I'm quoting from him it's almost universal it's almost universally accepted that killing others is wrong but life and the value of life have never been more discussed and debated than they have in recent years end quote now, most people acknowledge the value of human life, but we all don't agree on what that means or who it includes. Our culture is divided over the, over the value of unborn children, the elderly, and those who can't support or care for themselves. Others deem some lives are not valuable which is reflected in racism, racism, discrimination, and murder. God values all human life, or all human life. He makes no exceptions, and we are to value life as he does. So God wants us to realize that all human life is valuable. The point of this lesson respect human life as God does. Let's ask the Lord's blessing on this, on his word today. Heavenly Father, once again, we ask you, please show us the value of human life, that we may be obey, obedient to you from our hearts, that we may see others along with ourselves as you see us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We will be studying the scriptures, uh, the books of Exodus and 1 Samuel. Exodus chapter 20, verse 13, and 1 Samuel chapter 26, verses 7 through 11, and verses 22 through 25. Now, the setting from the scriptures... Uh, in section 1, we will be dividing our scripture into three sections. Section 1 will be Exodus chapter 20, verse 13. And the setting uh, takes us to Mount Sinai and the people of Israel, when the people of Israel listened to the Lord's words, which were the Ten Commandments at the time. These Ten Commandments emphasize how they were to live in the relation to God and to other people. 
Now the sixth commandment called for them to respect human life. Several hundred years later, David, whom God had chosen the next king of Israel, obeyed this command even though King Saul, the first ruler of Israel, sought to kill him. So now we get into one verse from the book of Exodus, verse 13 of chapter 20 of the book of Exodus, which says, pretty simply, you shall not murder. Now Genesis 1:26 says this, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And in Genesis 9 and 6, the Bible says, Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. Now, we are God image bearers, and he wants us to share his view that human life is precious, which is what the Sixth Commandment points out. Now, information shows us that the Sixth Commandment is written with only two Hebrew words, the Hebrew adverb, lo, or L-O, is a negative that can be translated no, not, or never. Translating no murder, never murder, do not kill. However, this is not a broad prohibition against any type of taking of human life. More specifically, the Hebrew term for murder, ratsack which occurs 47 times in the Old Testament, has, has a very specific range of meaning. Now the term can be defined as referring to unauthorized taking of human life for personal reasons. In the Old Testament, the term ratsack was also used to refer to a person who slew another accidentally and then fled to cities of refuge according to Numbers chapter 35 verse 6 and Joshua chapter 20. Now apart from that exception, this term is used exclusively in Scripture to refer to malicious, intentional action to kill an innocent person, which is premeditated murder. It is also related in part to human beings made in the image of God. God told Noah in Genesis 9 and 6, after the flood, that whoever sheds human blood, by humans his blood will be shed, for God made humans in his image. God made a distinction between murder and killing as the prescribed penalty for various crimes also. An example of this, God commander, commanded the Israelites to put to death those who committed crimes such as murder, Exodus 21:12, adultery, Leviticus 20 and 10, idolatry, Exodus 22 and 20, and human sacrifice, Leviticus 21 through 5. God also allowed for the taking of human life in specific cases. In certain instances, killing another person in war was allowable. Deuteronomy 13 and 15, 1 Samuel 15 and 3. In the New Testament, Romans chapter 13, governments are established by God and authorized by Him to use the sword, as it, as it is called. They are God's servant, Romans 13. Jesus Himself lists motives that lead to murder in Matthew 5, 21 and 22, which he says is anger. Now know what it says on page 50 of your personal study guides, page 50 
of your of your uh, study guides. It says hatred and defamation defamation typically comes rooted in bitterness and unforgiveness. When we allow these two things to fester in our lives, it produces a damaging stench of death. Left unattended, it not only affects others around us in many ways, but can also lead to our own spiritual and emotional health. Two questions challenge us in the uh, in the in the engage section of page one of fifty two of a personal study guide. If you look there quickly, number one, it asks us: Are you living with bitterness in your life? What caused you to become bitter? And number two, is God leading you to forgive someone who hurt you? The question comes up, what are some core truths that serve as the foundation of this command? Next we will consider the example of David in, in an encounter with Saul. As we study the Bible in section 2 of our scriptures, from 1 Samuel chapter 26 verses 7 through 11. It reads as follows, verse 7, so David and Abishai came to the people by night, and behold, Saul lay sleeping inside the circle of the camp, with his spear stuck in the ground at his head, and Abner and the people were lying around him. Then Abishai said to Saul, said to David, Today God has delivered your enemy into your hand. Now therefore, please let me strike him with the spear to the ground with one stroke, and I will not strike him a second time. But David said to Abishai, Do not destroy him, <clears throat> for who can, who can stretch out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be without guilt? David also said, As the Lord lives, surely the Lord will strike him, for his day will come that he dies, or he will go down into battle and perish. And in verse 11 it says, The Lord forbid that I should stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed, but now please take the spear that is at his head and the jug of water and let us go. As we note the verse-by-verse verse ex explanation, we find that in verse 7, which says, So David and Abishai came to the people by night, and behold, Saul lay sleeping inside the circle of the camp, with his spear stuck in the ground at his head, and Abner and the people were lying around him. Note what Deuteronomy 32:39 says. It says, See now, that I am he, and there is no God, beside me. It is I who put to death and give life. I have wounded, and it is I who heal. And there is no one who can deliver from my hand. Well, as God is saying, that he alone hath the authority to bring death and give life. We honor life as we show respect to God for his authority over all life. This is what David practiced. Now in contrast to King Saul, who did not accept God's will and repeatedly tried to kill David, who threatened his dynasty, even after God had chosen David and anointed him king over Israel, according to 1 Samuel 16, Saul demonstrated his unbelief in his behavior and tactics as a commander-in-chief of the Israeli army who was in pursuit of just one man, David. Saul set up his camp as if it were impenetrable, and he positioned himself within his camp as if no one could ever get to him. Now a typical army camp 
had equipment and animals on the outside as a barrier. Soldiers slept inside this perimeter. The commanders slept at the center and the safest part of the camp. In this case, apparently no soldier had stayed awake to guard the camp and sound the alarm in case of an attack. Saul slept with his spear stuck in the ground by his head, where he could grab it quickly if he needed, for, if he needed it for protection. So in verse number 8, it says, Then Abishai said to David, Today God has delivered your enemy into your hand. Now therefore, please let me strike him with the spear to the ground with one stroke, and I will not strike him a second time. Today God has delivered your enemy, the Bible says to you. Abishah says, the, the Hebrew verb for delivered means handed, handed over to. It pictures someone being hemmed in and thus in a vulnerable position to an opponent. Abishai requested permission to take care of David's problem. Abishai recognized the Lord's hand in this and therefore wanted to be the instrument to be used to solve the problem. However, David echoed his earlier words in the cave about not bringing harm to Saul, 1 Samuel 24, 6, who was the Lord's anointed. So in verse number 9, David, David, but David said to Abishai, Do not destroy him, for who can stretch out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be without guilt? This is similar to the title of three of David's uh, psalms, Psalm number 57, 58, and 59, where David also uh, is saying something similar. So they do not, don't destroy him. Psalms 57, 58, 59. You might want to jot that down. In Psalm 57, David wrote, Be gracious to me, O God. Be gracious to me, for my soul takes refuge in you. And in the shadow of your wings I will take refuge until destruction passes by. Now we can also learn from this by taking refuge in Christ depending on his faithful help and love, especially in times of trouble. When we face trials, God will quiet our hearts and give us confidence. In Psalm 58, David reminds himself and us that surely there is a God who judges on earth amidst the disastrous environment that we live in. In Psalm 59, David prays to God and mentions his situation with King Saul. He says in verses 3 and 4 of that psalm, For behold, they have set an ambush for my life. Fierce men launch an attack against me, not for my transgression, nor for my sin, O Lord. For no guilt of mine they run and set themselves against me. Arouse yourselves to help me and see. In the midst of all his trials, David prays, But as for me, I shall sing of your strength. Yes, I shall joyfully sing of your loving kindness in the morning. For you have been my stronghold and a refuge in the day of my distress. O oh, my strength, I will sing praises to you. For God is my stronghold, the God who shows me loving kindness. Now we can follow David's pattern when our trials come, prayer and praise for God's saving help. So while David had also been anointed king by Samuel, noted in six, verse chapter 16, verse 12 through 13, he wanted to remain innocent in God's sight, not be liable for God's judgment because of sin. So David expressed his trust in God's sovereignty also, his authority and control over the world he had created. In verse 10, David also said, As the Lord lives, surely the Lord will strike him, or his day will come that he, that he dies. 
or he will go down into the battle and perish. Now, in, ref in refusing to harm Saul, David showed respect for human life as well as honoring God, who has authority over all life. David was certain that God, in whatever way and time he determined, would bring about the king's eventual, eventual death. Verse 11 says, The Lord forbid that I should stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. But now please take the spear that is at his head and the jug of water and let us go. So David repeated the vow that he would never do anything to injure Saul, the Lord's anointed. The spear that was stuck in the ground by Saul's head represented Saul's power, while the water jug, actually the water in it, represented Saul's life. David was telling Saul that he, David, had Saul's life in his hands. In what concrete way can you value the life of someone who aggravates or opposes you? Now when have you been in a situation where others were telling you to do something, but you knew it was not the right thing to do. Next we shall see, consider David's interchange with Saul as we study the Bible from section 3, 1 Samuel chapter 26, verses 22 through 25. Before we read the scriptures though, I want to share with you an illustration. We have two situations. We have a physical wound and an emotional wound. A physical injury or wound and an emotional injury or wound. How do we treat those? Well, the physical wound, we would clean the wound to prevent infection, right? Then we would apply some antiseptic for continued protection. And then we will cover the wound for added protection to keep it clean so the body can heal the wound. Well, how do we, how do we treat an emotional wound? Proper treatment for an emotional wound uh, to prevent infection, well, that infection is considered to be resentment, bitterness, and hatred. The antiseptic that would take away all three is forgiveness. Forgiveness will also keep the three types of infection away as they certainly will try to return. That's a pretty good illustration. Isn't it? I know I find that very very interesting to practice and I've been trying to practice that uh, since I read it. Okay, 1 Samuel chapter 26, verses 22 through 25. The Bible says this, Then Saul said, I have sinned. Return, my son, David, for I will not harm you again because my life was precious in your sight this day. Behold, I have played the fool and have committed a serious error. Verse 22, David replied, Behold the spear of the king. Now let one of your young men come over and take it. Verse 23, The Lord will re repay each man for his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord delivered you into my hand today. But I refuse to stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. Verse 24, now behold, as your life was highly valued in, in my sight this day, so may my life be highly valued in the sight of the Lord, and may he deliver me from all distresses. Verse 25, Then Saul said to David, Blessed are you, my son David. You will both accomplish much and surely prevail. So David went on his way, and Saul returned to his place. 
a verse-by-verse -verse explanation of the section 3 of this of our scriptures. David replied, Behold the spear of the king. Now let one of your young men come over and take it. We find that David and Abishai had retreated to a distant mountain after taking Saul's spear and water jug from beside King Saul. David then shouted from his position to Abner, the general of, of uh, King Saul's army. Noting the king's spear and water jug containing uh, the king's water, David wanted them to know that they all should be put to death because they could not protect the king of Israel, the Lord's anointed. David emphasized his insignificance and declared he was innocent of any wrongdoing against the king. Saul then confessed his sin and noted his foolishness and then vowed he would never harm David again and he asked David to come back. 1 Samuel 26 verse 21 Though David would not go over uh, to the king, he held up the king's spear and offered to return it if one of Saul's young men would come over and get his symbol of the king's authority. He says, the Lord will repay each man for his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord delivered you into my hand, but I refuse to stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. Information tells us that the Hebrew verb for repay is often translated return, restore, or bring back. This idea is similar to Paul's words about sowing and reaping in Galatians 6, 7-10. The word righteousness means right behavior based on God's standards, his law, especially in human relationships. The word loyalty pictures someone who supports or upholds what God has said, who is faithful or loyal to the Lord and to his covenant stipulations. Now this is why David did not lift his hand or take action against the Lord's anointed. In asserting his innocence, David essentially highlighted Saul's guilt. David asked that God would treat him as he had treated Saul. David had considered Saul's life valuable. David didn't presume upon God, but he knew the Lord respects human life and thus asks God to value his life. Verse 24 says, Now behold, as your life was highly valued in my sight this day, so may my life be highly valued in the sight of the Lord, and may he deliver me from all distress. David didn't ask the king to stop chasing and trying to kill him. 1 Samuel 27, 1. He expected it to continue. David had considered Saul's life valuable. David also asked the Lord to rescue me from all, all trouble. So what would it mean to let God vindicate you when you encounter a conflict this week at work or at home? Verse 25 says, Then Saul said to David, Blessed are you, my son David, you will both accomplish much and surely prevail. So David went on his way and Saul returned to his place. Saul addressed David as, My son. The king mentioned how God had blessed David. The king declared how David would do great things. King Saul also noted that David would prevail. So how can believers speak up for those whose lives have been devalued by the world? Turn now with me to page 56 of the Personal Study Guide. Page 56. And there's a scripture verse there. Micah chapter 6 verse 8. You can find that in your Bibles. And let's read that. It reads this this way from the NASB. 
He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Now this is how we can live out this truth as we seek to honor all life. To act justly includes acting justly toward the innocent and vulnerable and seeking to protect their lives. To love faithfulness or kindness involves consistently and faithfully pursuing life and liberty for those who are at risk of losing both. To walk humbly requires that we consider others more important than ourselves, Philippians 2 and 3. So are there people in your life for whom you need to show mercy, even though it might not be deserved? So let's live this out this week. How will you actively seek out or seek to show value of all life? to all life. First, we can check our attitudes. If we privately consider some people more important than others, confess that we should confess to God and repent. While the world deems countless people as inferior or less important, we are called to see all people as God sees them. Then we can check our words. Examine our involvement in devaluing life through the words we speak to others or about others. Words of anger, malice, bitterness, or even apathy do not honor the lives of those God loves. So we need to repent and determine to speak only those words that build others up. Ephesians 4.29 and then we can check our actions. We can look for concrete ways we can affirm the value of life in our spheres of influence. Practical actions can include counseling at a pro-life pregnancy center, helping a parent with a disabled child, bringing joy to the forgotten in a nursing home, or engaging with the work of praying for and supporting the persecuted. Well, it's up to us, to each of us, to validate and affirm this value in what we think, what we say, and what we do. So the point of this session, respect human life as God does. We should be involved in all three of these applications if possible. So now let's wrap it up. We should reflect on feelings of anger and bitterness allowed to, to fester in our hearts. Get those out. Remember what we said earlier. The antiseptic for an emotional wound is forgiveness. Don't forget our need to forgive. So these damaging feelings will not or no longer keep us enslaved to resentment. Let us close in prayer. Father, Father, Lord, God, we thank you and we praise you. Please help us to be mindful that all human life is valuable to you and should be for us also. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.